to gain 30 years ago, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital made a major commitment to integrating the arts into their clinical practice. I was Minister of the Arts uh, about 20 years ago, and it seemed to me then a no-brainer that we ought to be working with the Department of Health, and I found my counterpart minister at that time in the Department of Health, John Hutton, and some of his officials, by no means all, but some, <coughs> were very responsive and receptive. We did useful work, I like to think, with NHS Estates in trying to make sure that the second round of PFI-funded hospitals was slightly less nightmarish in design than the first round had been. But um, up, until, up until now, the arts and culture have been pretty marginal to medical thinking, medical practice. Um, the, their position has been fragile. Uh, progress has been in fits and starts, a lot of, a lot of discontinuities. The Department of Health and the Arts Council of England actually got to the point um, around about 2007, eight, uh, that sort of time, when uh, they were ready to issue a prospectus for arts and health, but um, ministers rather lost their nerve with a little bit of negative publicity from the Daily Mail, <coughs> so uh, the initiative ran into the sand. A short while later, Alan Johnson, when he was Secretary of State for Health, uh, made a wonderful speech in which he said everything that uh, those of us who were passionate about this wanted to hear the Secretary of State say, but then Alan had always really wanted to be a rock musician, uh, it was only a fallback position in the Secretary of State for Health, and he shortly got reshuffled to, to become Home Secretary, and uh, his successors were terribly interested in, in this kind of thing. Um, until Matt Hancock became Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, and as you know, uh, Matt Hancock has put a whole new emphasis on the prevention agenda. He is saying that prevention is crucial to the future of healthcare in this country, and that's indeed that social prescribing is crucial to the future of the prevention strategy. And this is, this is graven in his long-term plan, and uh, what is also extremely encouraging to me is that he has propelled the arts and culture into the foreground and into the center of his conception of social because when we first started to talk to Dr. Michael Dixon and others who were developing the, the social prescribing network, it, the arts and culture weren't particularly prominent in the way they envisaged social prescribing developing. Yes, people were to go for brisk walks every, every day. Yes, it might be a good idea if they did a bit of volunteering. Uh, yes, a spot of gardening would be quite good for them. They haven't quite thought about the arts and culture in the way that they very definitely now are. So we're extremely encouraged. <coughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the All Party Parliamentary Group, which with colleagues I founded in 2014. Uh, a number of us thought that this was potentially very important and we wanted to promote awareness of the potential benefits of the arts and culture to health and well-being, and we wanted to stimulate progress. The, uh, colleagues I was particularly working with at that time, um, Paul Burstow, who had been Minister of State at the Department of Health, and uh, Sarah Williston, Dr. Sarah Williston, I'm sure you are fully aware, a um, marvellous politician, very independent person, great perspective as well, and she was one of our officers as we formed the group initially. We've had active involvement um, from about 40 parliamentarians, both Houses of Parliament, and across the political parties. So there is a, a considerable body of thoughtful support uh, for the proposition in Parliament. Uh, contrary to the folklore, uh, the members of Parliament do occasionally pay attention to something other than Brexit. I'm pleased to say that when they're not doing Brexit, they're doing arts and health. Um, <laughs> we decided we did, we, they should be doing rather more arts and health. <laughs> We, we decided that uh, it would be a good idea to establish an inquiry to report on the state of the arts in health in, the, in, the, in this country. Uh, the newly formed uh, All Party Group was supported by uh, the National Alliance for Arts, Health and Wellbeing, predecessor body to what is now the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, that always consistently in the person of Alex Kulter, who is at Zenon who is our project manager and has done a fantastic uh, job for us. 
uh, are partners in the inquiry with the Royal Society for Public Health, King's College London, where our researcher, Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt, was, was based, and the Guys of St. Thomas Trust. Our funders were Welcome, Paul Hamlet Foundation, and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, <coughs> the research aspect of it. So we had, these, these were serious partners. Um, we, our methodology was to hold a series of round tables and lead up to publication of our report. We held 16 round tables, uh, drawing in people from all across the country, some 300 people, mix of disciplines, professional competencies, backgrounds, uh, health people, arts people, administrators, clinicians, um, service users, very importantly, who were involved with this work. And Alex did a remarkable job in pulling people together and they were very exciting meetings, great energy, uh, great uh, generation of new relationships, new, new ideas, uh, new resolve indeed came through from, from this process. We also made a call for evidence and uh, something in excess of 170 responses demonstrated that a lot of people around the country were thinking and working in this field. We published this report, you have the short version of it here, called Creative Health in July 2017. The report <coughs> has three key messages in it. Uh, the first is that the arts can help keep us well, aid our recovery if we fall ill, and if we experience a long-term condition, help us to uh, live better lives for longer. The arts can, uh, can support the health and social care system in facing some of the major challenges that it does, aging, long-term conditions, loneliness, mental health. And thirdly, that the arts can save money in the health, uh, in the health and social care systems. And the report, particularly the long report, which is a big document uh, with lots of footnotes and references and links, provides a wealth of evidence, we contend, in support of those three propositions. The evidence uh, it is, of course, of many kinds, but to those of us uh, who heard service users giving their testimonies at the round table, um, the evidence of service users was, was most compelling. And I'm going to just read to you one little piece of that evidence coming from Gloucestershire, Ellen's territory. This is, this is a man called Russell who, uh, who uh, attended a program run by a charity called Heartlift. He was, uh, he was prescribed uh, painting. He had had a stroke, and he describes what all this meant to him. I had split up from my partner, find myself without anywhere to live, and couldn't see my children. I couldn't work as I wasn't physically able to do the job, and wasn't in a position mentally or financially to start a building business again after going bankrupt. Since going to Artlift, I have had several exhibitions of my work around Gloucester, I find that painting in the style that I do, in a very expressionistic way, seems to help me emotionally. I no longer take any medication, and although I'm not without problems, I find that as long as I can paint, I can cope. It doesn't mean that depression is gone, but I no longer keep having to go back to my GP for more antidepressants. I just lock myself away and paint until I feel slightly better. I now mentor some people who have been through Artlift themselves and they come and use my studio a couple of times a week to get together, paint, draw, and chat, and I can see the benefit to them over the time they've been doing it. Well, we get a stroke, depression, but uh, among the benefits for him with his experience of painting is that he no longer has to, has to keep going to see his GP off his medication, and that I think is, is, is quite significant. But um, you may say, not unreasonably, you can't generalize from kind <coughs> of testimonies. These are individuals, however moving it may be to learn about their experience. Nonetheless, we can't base our policy on this, and uh, you've got serious responsibilities towards your patients, your finances, and so forth. So maybe if statistics are more kind of evidence that you prefer. Um, I mentioned Dr. Simon Afer. Uh, he has been very, very methodical in his approach to evaluating his own use of social prescribing in his practice. And over a three-year period, 
he um, monitored what was happening with that patient group, and he found that uh, in, the, in, in that period, patients receiving social prescribing <coughs> through the Artlift charity uh, made 37% less demands for GP appointments, and I had 27% less need for hospital appointments. Well, I, I would be cautious, as you would be, to extrapolate too far from a piece of evidence like that, where the, the full creative health report offers a variety of other examples of statistical evidence. But if we can extrapolate from that, we are looking at the potential for a very significant reduction of the burden of demand on GPs, and we are indeed looking at a, a potentially a significant saving in costs to the NHS. But I would emphasize that as I see it, and as I think the Secretary of State sees it, the primary rationale for social prescribing is not to save money, it's to improve the quality of life of patients and of our population. But nonetheless, we all know that it's really, really useful if you can save significant amounts of money. Well, you will see in this short report, we've made a selection of some of the case studies that are discussed more extensively within the full report. Uh, there's a project called Creative Families in Southwark, which has been evidently very supportive of mothers with postnatal depression and of their children. Uh, there's a project called Staying Well, which uh, was started in Cordendale, and they found it good, and they kept it going, and that, uh, that has helped enormously with the problem of loneliness, issues associated with loneliness. And then there's another project called Stroke Estra in Hull, where people who've, who've had strokes have learned to play musical instruments, again, with quite remarkable results. And all of that can be uh, studied in the, full, in the full report. In the full report, we quote uh, endorsements from Sir Michael Marmont, Professor Darcy, Professor Richard, Richard Layard, Rob Webster, who many of you will know as a colleague in, in, in West Yorkshire, Duncan Selby from uh, Health England, Lord O'Donnell, former head of the civil service, Sir Robert Francis, who did the report on mid staffs uh, disaster. These are serious people uh, who, who studied the report and given us very explicit and uh, very, very encouraging endorsements. The report was received very well internationally. It's even been translated into Japanese. Um, very good reception in Scandinavia. I was recently talking at a, at a conference at the Karolinska Institute, and in USA, and in, and in Australia. However, it wasn't universally received. There was a, I don't know whether you should call it a chat room, a Twitter network or something, of, of GPs in, in this country who didn't like it when it came out. They were grumpy. And there's words to the effect, oh God, not another bright idea coming from a bunch of people in London who don't understand us, don't, just don't realize what it's like trying to do the job we've got to do. Um, and so we, 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 we recognize that uh, there's quite a long way to go to persuade people who are very hard pressed in their professional work and, uh, and uh, maybe a little bit dubious as to what we're talking about. In the report, we make 10 specific recommendations, and in the 18 months since we issued the report, we've developed strategies to promote, to advance uh, acceptance and implementation of these recommendations. One is that there should be a national strategic center for, for the arts, health, and well-being. I would like to call it the Creative Health Center. And, um, the, the, the main roles for this centre would be to disseminate knowledge, uh, to be to, 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 to advocate at a national level, and to get a bit of coherence into the system, because you've got a mass of initiatives all around the country, very well-meaning, very dedicated, often extremely effective <coughs> organisations, individuals, charities, voluntary sector groups, professional organisations, and so forth, but very disparate, a bit of a jumble. And, um, we think that uh, we, we, we need to weave this together a little bit nationally, not to impose upon them and tell them how to do their job, but really to take an overview and to see where the gaps may be and to see what can be done to stimulate um, the filling of those gaps. And very importantly, to make sure that um, those who are on the professional health side, as opposed to the arts and culture side, 
um, have a point of reference and know that there's an organisation to support them. And I see a very important role of the health centre as being to, to, to be a resource, uh, to, 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 to be there potentially to support those doctors and other, the, uh, other people working in the health service who want to pick this up and run with it, but may not be quite sure where to go for the information they need. And I think, I think we can do that. It would, however, be a pretty small organisation. It needs to be kept lean. We don't want to spend masses of money on it. It will be philanthropically funded. Uh, we anticipate that it will be housed in a health institution rather than in a cultural institution because I think the symbolism of that is, is important. Um, we recommend that there should be a cross-government strategy to promote the use of the arts in, in healthcare. Um, there was an immediately a very positive response from the culture department and since Matt Hancock has been in post health, um, it's now clear that that cross-governmental strategy is coming into being. We recommended thirdly that uh, uh, at board or senior executive level in a, in a whole range of organisations that have responsibility one way or another for the delivery of health care, whether it's, whether it's clinical permissioning groups, whether it's provider trusts, whether it's health and wellbeing boards, all of these, an individual should be designated to take responsibility for institutional policy for um, engagement of the arts in, in health and well-being. And uh, that is now starting to happen on a significant scale. I'm getting, getting more and more letters from people saying, yes, we've, we've made that decision, we've made, we've made that appointment. Now, there is a, a recommendation that I will actually read to you because it's so relevant to your good selves. This is recommendation number four. We recommend that those responsible for NHS new models of care and sustainability, so new models of care and sustainability and transformation partnerships, 18 months on, we would use the language of integrated care systems, ensure that arts and cultural organizations are involved in the delivery of health and well-being at regional and local level. But I like to think that your invitation to be here, Alex, to be here today is, uh, is is an, is an instance that, that is starting to happen and it's very exciting for us. The recommendation to the Arts Council that they should, uh, in, the, in the development of their new 10-year strategy, they should encourage all the organisations that they fund, cultural funding, to integrate health work into, into, into their programmes and make it, make it intrinsic to what they do. And I think with the publication of the Arts Council strategy imminent, I'm very optimistic that is going to be that. And then there's another recommendation that I would also read to you. Um, this is number six. We recommend that NHS England and the Social Prescribing Network support clinical commissioning groups, NHS provider trusts, and local authorities to incorporate arts on prescription into their commissioning plans and to redesign and care pathways where appropriate. Well, it's clear that that is happening and the guidance that has emanated from NHS England does exactly that, so that's 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 brilliant. Um, then we have recommendations that uh, organisations, representative of service users, patients' association, health watch should advocate for for um, the involvement of, of the arts in healthcare, and we have encouraged the setting up of an organisation of service users themselves, and it's for them to develop it and run it as they will. It's called the Lens Living Experience Network. But that is, that is now up and running and uh, beginning to make progress. We've got recommendations on education, curriculum in medical schools, but also the curriculum, the, the curriculum in art schools. And uh, that's a bit slower. We haven't, we haven't scored any helpful hits there yet. But it, we want to do so. It's very important because it really is the fountainhead of changing culture and for the, for the, for, for the new generation of professionals recommendations on research and some quite significant funding from the research councils is now starting to come. And a recommendation for NICE, who have agreed the recommendation that where the evidence warrants it, they should include in their guidance uh, uh, advice about how uh, practitioners can use the arts in the work that they do. Well, how much scepticism and resistance is, is there still? Probably a good deal. In my foreword to the full report, I, I, I had a paragraph or two discussing that, 
I think it has a lot to do with traditional uh, curricula in, med in medical schools. And it is difficult, after all, isn't it, for professional people in any walk of life, not just medical professionals, who have been through a process of professional formation, uh, both uh, uh, in their university studies and subsequently in their experience of, of professional practice, to think differently, to reorientate how they do things. Of course, that's challenging and difficult and takes time. Another problem, I think, is that the criteria that are used to evaluate research in the medical field, um, particularly RCTs, are not really applicable very appropriately to quite small, quite individual projects that simply don't, aren't amenable to that kind of methodology. Um, so that's, that, that's another problem. Something to do with the, shall we say, somewhat technical and bureaucratic culture of the NHS, not necessarily very receptive to all this lovely stuff, all this glittering stuff about the, about the, about the arts. And importantly, I think there has been a lack of clarity about what the return on investment would be. Resources are very scarce and very precious, and uh, you need to be you need to be confident that you're justified in using even small resources for, for this kind of work. And the evidence, all too often, isn't sufficiently clear that that it is after all warranted. I would say another problem has been that on the arts and culture side, too many of the organisations have been a bit diffident about their own advocacy. And indeed, in the evaluations of their work, there hasn't been perhaps sufficient rigor to make these evaluations always convincing. And doctors rightly demand evidence. They need, they need to be sure of them. They're not consigning their patients to, to be looked after by you know, dodgy little organizations that won't do. And so you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be confident that that's the right thing. Um, the workload. Is another problem. I mean, doctors are struggling to keep the show on the road, to cope from day to day the volume of demand for their work. And it's very, very hard to stand back and think, oh, maybe I should be doing something a little bit difficult. I was talking to Dr. Helen Stokes Lampard, and she was saying good doctors have always used social prescription. It may not have been the language they used, but they got to know their patients as individual human beings. And, and would make a judgment about what might be right for that person. And in more present circumstances, it's harder and harder, if not impossible, for doctors to, to, to work in that kind of way, which is, which is so difficult. So I think, and I'm about to finish, Nathan, I think that um, the time is, has indeed come to recognize and to, and, to, uh, and to make a reality of the power of the arts and culture to support health and, and well-being. And we know that the prevention strategy has to take centre stage for all sorts of reasons. Um, we know also that ethos and practice within healthcare have to move more towards collaboration, and reaching out and joining forces, less fragmentation, less endless competition and struggle. And uh, I just would like to think that as you develop your concept of integrated care systems, you will want the arts and culture to be part of what you integrate. I see it as a resource for you. I see it as a great opportunity for you. No one is suggesting that it should be imposed. No one is suggesting that major financial resources should be diverted to it. The proposition is that uh, the department will fund a thousand new link workers whose job it will be where a doctor wishes to make a social prescription for a patient, to find the appropriate provider of what it is that the doctor is prescribing. So we're not asking that the chief PhD themselves become in detail experts on social prescribing. Of course, GPs will continue to take responsibility for the patients that need to be satisfied with what's being prescribed is going to be delivered in an appropriate way. But I, I don't think that this should be hugely burdensome, indeed, given that such a significant proportion of GP appointments are for people who don't have a clinically diagnosable condition, but who've got some kind of personal social problem that falls far short pathologically of, of, of something that should be medicalized. Um, here, I think, is, is an additional resource, an additional opportunity for GPs. And I think it's a very exciting thing, and I think 